media is streaming live on Facebook. There we go. We're live. Yay. All right. Hey, everybody. It's Katie from Kestrel. I'm super excited to be here with Todd and Colby from Accuracy First. We're going to talk about Accuracy First, the new page that's on the Kestrel, and try and answer some of the questions that people have been giving us over this week in prep for this. So thanks, guys. Welcome. Yep. Glad to be Glad here. To be here. Um, so I think off the bat, we should probably talk about the Accuracy First page because it's gotten a lot of people talking. Um, you know, obviously the people that get to train with you guys directly have a lot of knowledge about it, but there's so many applications for everybody else and they're curious about it. Yeah, there is, uh, it, it's something we've been kind of asking for, for probably four or five years. Uh, but with the advent of speed drop and some of the things, especially, you know, with the uh, wind dots uh, in the trimmers, reticles, uh, the quick wind, a lot of the stuff that we came up with at Accuracy First, a lot of the classes the guys have to sit through and try to memorize how to do things, how to find your quick wind number, how to uh, calibrate your wind dots, uh, what is your speed drop number, uh, what's your 12 inch drill. So now automatically the cast drill does this for you. So it's an amazing tool. Uh, that it kind of, we need to go a little bit deeper. I'll let Kobe get into speed drop and talk about uh, what are the limits, where it's going to work to, where it starts at. And then we'll probably go a little deeper into something he figured out, which was the dial down method of speed drop and how that changes your wind dot to the quick wind number instead of the actual wind dot calibration. Yeah. And yep. that is kick ass. I love it. So go ahead. <laughs> Well, so if, if we want to go ahead and jump into that, we can. That's pretty easy. So uh, with speed drop, the, the primary goal with speed drop is to, to give guys the capability of memorizing one number and one number only. And from that number, be able to get elevation holds. Um, a lot of the times guys don't have access to a Kestrel or can't access it easily or quickly or something like that. And having capability of getting a number or getting an elevation hold fast is, is important and still being accurate. And that's, that's one of the things obviously that's important as well. Um, and so what speed drop does is it allows you to memorize one number and we take advantage of higher muzzle velocity and higher VC ballistics where it's very flat, it's very linear. Um, and so what we're able to do is then come in and find a number that we can effectively subtract from our range to get our elevation. Hold. And when I say subtract from our range, it really is, range divided by 100, but I don't like to say that. Really, it's just you put a decimal point in front of your uh, uh, the 100 place uh, for your range, and then you take that number off. And so what that does is it gives you an elevation hold that's relatively close. And, and what the beauty of speed drop is you're able to set your air budget. How accurate are you willing to be, um, or how much air are you willing to accept in this, in this formula? Um, a little bit bigger air allows for um, greater distance and stuff like that. Smaller air brings that, that capability in a little bit closer. Um, and really, when you're looking at defining what that number is and stuff like that, what that is, um, is all dependent on one, how far do you want to use this tool out to? And two, what is the size of the target, right? So if, if you're coming in and you're shooting at targets and they're smaller targets, and obviously I'm going to try to come in and limit my air capability to 0.1 mils or something like that. But if I've got a relatively larger target, I may accept 0.2 or something like that. So it's all dependent on when you're defining how much air you're willing to accept. It's all dependent on the size of your target and ultimately how far you want to take this tool out to. Um, with 300 wind mags, 300 normas, 300 PRCs, and all these different higher BC, higher muzzle velocity calibers, you're able to use this tool all the way up to about a thousand meters and beyond. Um, yeah, it, real quick, it, it actually kind of works out to about three quarters of the distance of trans. Yeah. So with a uh, 300 norma that goes 1600 meter at trans, uh, we're looking at, it works really well out to about 1200 meters. Uh, with a, th or a 300 wind mag that is probably 1100 meters is trans, uh, it works really good to about 850. So doing the math, three quarters of the distance to trans is about where it quits working. Uh, but this capability gives you Every 10 meters, you know your hold. And, and when Colby's talking about uh, how much leniency you want to have on real accuracy, whether it's 0.1 or 0.2 mils, you, you know, you're going to have that uh, tolerance budget is going to be nearly in the middle of that range part. So if you're 300 to 800, in the five to 600 range, you're going to be 0.2 off. So real quick, you can just, hey, I'm going to actually go back in and put 0.2 mils back in there. And now you're corrected all the way down to perfect. So you can keep that 0.2 tolerance and actually run it over a longer range card 
and then just keep that air working uh, and correct for it in the middle of that range card. But with it, the beauty of this tool is, you know your hold every 10 meters all the way out. You don't have to stop, look at a range card, uh, pull your eye out of, you know, out of the uh, scope, you know, look at the Kestrel, uh, do everything that we normally have to do. All you right. need to do is range it and immediately you got your hold. And that's, but, and that's the beauty of it. Oh, sorry, sorry, you guys ahead. mentioned a lot of different rifle systems, but um, so 6.5 Creedmoor is super popular right now, 260 Remington, will this work for that one? Definitely. But and, 308 and is a little too curvy? It, the 308 works really well out to about 450 meters. Uh, you can mm -hmm. kind of push it out to about five, but you know, about five's the limit for it, uh, for the speed drop. So it, it's, you need a good BC and a good Mazda velocity. Normally we say uh, 2,700 feet per second with a 0.5 BC, it'll work. Uh, so if you're faster than that, obviously, if you're running 2,900 with a 0.3 BC, like a 5.56, that doesn't mean it's going to work just because you exceed one of those numbers. So if you have an average, it's over a 0.5 with 2,700. So if you're running uh, 2,800 with a 0.46, it may work, you know, fine for you there. But it, it, it does work with the 6.5 Creed and the 260, works really well with them. Again, it's going to work out to about that same range, you know, uh, probably in the neighborhood of, 700 meters, you know, maybe 750 meters, depending on your muzzle velocity. Awesome. So say I did this whole thing and my speed drop gave me uh, 1.8. Colby, can you tell me the super really cool thing I get to do of dialing yeah, down? Yeah, so there's, there's real quick on the 1.8. So um, what that 1.8 means, let's talk about what that is first. Yeah. Uh, 1.8, what you need to do is then come and subtract that from your range and that'll give you your elevation hold to within whatever tolerance budget you've set. All right, so there's there's a couple ways you can do that. If, if you like math and it, it, it doesn't scare you away, you can just go ahead and take 1.8 off of your range. So um, if you're shooting at 480, you just do 4.8 minus 1.8 kind of thing. Um, another way of doing that is go ahead and say minus two and take off 0.2 too much and then add 0.2 back at the end. So 480, you would say minus two is 2.8 and then plus 0.2 back at the end and then, and then you'd be at three. Um, and so that's a little bit easier way of doing it by breaking it up into two steps if you got to do the math in your head. Um, but the cool deal, if you can dial down, so think of it this way, right? Um, if I have to come in and subtract from my range to get my elevation hold, another way of doing that, so let's say it says 1.8, so I would have to subtract from my range 1.8 to get my elevation hold. Reverse think that, and let's say add 1.8 to my elevation hold, I'd just get my range. It's, it's the same thing, it's just thinking about it in another direction. Well, how can we add 1.8 to all my elevation holds? We can add 1.8 by simply dialing below zero, the other direction that you normally dial, but dialing below zero past your zero stop. If you have it set there, you'd have to adjust your zero stop, but dialing down 1.8. Now, by dialing down 1.8, what we've done is just come in and added 1.8 mils to all my elevation holds, and therefore inside of the speed drop territory, my range is my elevation, all right? So if you're shooting at 480, you just hold 4.8 mils. And it's accurate to within whatever tolerance budget you set it up to. Um, and so that's, that's the beauty of that dialing down method is now inside of speed drop, there is absolutely zero math, there's no thought. You just hold your range, you pull the trigger and it's incredibly accurate. Um, and so that's, that's really what I love about this tool. Uh, another thing I've come in, and, and this may be for another video in the future, is, is combining speed drop with your max point blank capability. So if you're running um, and out shooting you know, coyotes or something like that, then you have the capability of combining this speed drop tool with your max point blank tool, which is something that a lot of you know, hunters have done in the past by zeroing you know, 200 yards or something like that, um, or you know, making the bullet hit a certain amount of inches high, 100 or however they want to do it. Really, that's just a, a form of max point blank. Uh, but now we can come in and figure out a way to combine it with um, speed drop, and now our world becomes extremely simple. Um, another way of real quick managing this is if you can't, let's say you can't come in and dial um, down 1.8, all right? So I can't dial it down because I have a scope that doesn't allow me to dial below zero or it doesn't mm -hmm. allow me to dial all the way down 1.8. What can I do? All right? Well, if you can dial down a little bit, let's say it only lets me dial down a mil, that's it, no more. All right? What you can do is dial down 0.8 and then just take off one from your, all right? Another way of doing it, it's easy math. Uh, another way of doing it is let's say you can't dial down at all because there's some scopes out there that let you down like a half mil 
um, they'll let you dial down or 0.3 or whatever it is. Um, another way of doing it is, let's say I can't dial down at all. You can dial up 0.2, right? So by dialing up 0.2, I turn my gun into a minus two gun. And a lot of times, Katie, uh, we get into different scopes that won't go below zero. So if you was gonna, you could actually have two meals set for your 100 meter zero, and now mm -hmm. you could come all the way down to zero and then come up two clicks and now you're 1.8. So you just have two oh. meals being zero instead of zero. zero. And that way you right. say, hey, I gotta dial up six meals. Boom, you go eight. Two plus six yeah. is eight. Now you've dialed up. You just know you're always plus two on your dial. Yeah. So you can still work this even if you can't go below your uh, zero stop. Yeah, that's a great point because there are some people that get stuck with the scopes that they can't dial down. Yep, yep, correct. So we've gotten a couple questions. So Cameron wanted to know if you plan to publish any of the muzzle velocity trends that you've found for pot, for the powder temperature changes. I think we talked about powder temperature changes in one of our videos. And You know, that he, here's the deal. Most of the time uh, we stay so busy uh, working with military every week that we're, we're using the same powders all the time. So mm -hmm. uh, it, as far as muzzle velocity trends, as far as temperature sensitivity, uh, that it, it's a real simple tool. We developed this way back in about 2006 with the MV temp tables. So th this is something that is easy to do. All you have to do is shoot a known temperature uh, and then go in and create another known temperature velocity. So you may shoot at 30 degrees and then you may shoot at 80 degrees, plug it in. And it's going to interpolate uh, in between those and give you muzzle velocity based on your actual ambient temperature. The main key here is making sure that your ammo is at ambient temperature. There, you know, we teach different methods uh, when your ammo is not at ambient temperature, how to manage that inside the Kestrel. It's really not that hard. Uh, but as far as different powders, it, it's, it's something that would be, you know, as many different powders as, as there is. You know, H1000 in Retumbo is not that temperature sensitive. Uh, you'd have to do any, a mass amount of testing to actually come out with a chart. It would be awesome if somebody would, but then you get into, uh, yeah, it, you're getting into, you know, talking bad <laughs> about other companies. And so you're saying, hey, this company's powder is really awesome, uh, like Hodgson, because Hodgson is really good, you know, with temperature sensitivities. And then you may say, you know, uh, Vitavori is pretty temperature sensitive which we, everybody knows we love Vitavori and Lapua stuff. So uh, whether, you know, Vitavori is temperature sensitive, some of it is, some of it isn't. Uh, same mm -hmm. with Hodgson, some of theirs is and some of it isn't. So it's one of those things. The answer to this question is no, we're not actually working towards <laughs> building a list of uh, powders because it, it's pretty strenuous to get that much uh, testing done uh, with, with all the available powders that there are out there, but it's such an easy tool to use inside the Kestrel and, you know, to run into your MV temp table, plug in a known velocity at a known temperature, grab another one later, and then it'll automatically, once you turn it on, start interpolating and doing your math for you. So let's start real quick about how to do that, just for the sake of the guys out there who maybe have never done it before. What's an easy way to do it? An easy way to do it is come in, throw some ammo in the freezer. All right, throw some ammo in the freezer and now get it down real cold. Um, and then come in, take a temperature measure, uh, measurement of it. If you have a chronograph, awesome. If you don't, you can true. Uh, and then you get a velocity reading out of that cold ammo. Um, just try to do it fast. Or if you have to go out to the range, take it from the freezer, stick it in the cooler, and then take that temperature measurement right before you put it in your gun true. Or shoot through the chrono either one. Um, but so do that and then maybe do one at ambient. And if, if it, you're in a place where it's really cold and it sucks all the time, that's cool too. You can come in um, and maybe stick it on the dash and heat the ammo up, all right? Uh, one thing to be careful of if you heat it up on the dash is taking temperature of the case and not the actual powder inside. Um, that can cause an issue uh, if you don't leave it up on the dash to heat up long enough and stuff like that. But really what you're looking for, no matter how you go out doing this, is now that we have that, that, that slope function available in the core, um, what all I have to really do is come in and look at uh, a muzzle velocity at a certain temperature. So I freeze some ammo and let's say it's uh, 2,500 foot per second at 30 degrees. All right, so that ammo at 30 degrees, I get a muzzle velocity 2,500 foot per second. Uh, let's say at 130 degrees, all right, so now it's 100 degrees hotter, I get 2,600 foot per second. All right, so really what I'm looking for is a slope. I'm looking for how much foot per second increase do I get with muzzle velocity for every 
degree of temperature change that I see in this ammo. And then I come in, I plug that into the slope and I'm done. So really you only have to do this twice and that's for the lot of the powder. And one of the reasons that probably won't be published in a lot of this, this powder data that we've been taking is because if, let's say I shoot some IMR 464 powder, right? So I come in and I do that, that varies wildly with lot. And so just to say, hey, the average of this lot is X, then you come in, you shoot it, it may be completely different for you. Even though it was the average um, across what we tested, that doesn't mean that it's anywhere close to, I mean, the, the standard deviation in it can be wild, is what I'm saying. So, um, no, we probably won't be testing it in large part for that reason, um, or publishing at least in large part for that reason. Um, and so, it, and the other reason being that there's way too much data to come in and try to pull and push and um, do it. So, yeah, yeah so that, that's how you would come in and do it. Um, all right, so totally changing topics. Dan asked, as a new shooter that's using the Tremor 3 and has the new 5700X, do you guys have any classes that, they, that you would recommend that they could go to to really get the most out of using both? As a new shooter, he's doing really well so far. I know, these are really good choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you it know, might be just the new shooter with that part. <laughs> yeah. So we do have uh, civilian classes. So Pete Gould actually teaches a lot of civilian classes down in Austin uh, Gun Club and in Clarendon, Texas as well. Uh, we have them posted on the Accuracy First website. Uh, Kevin Owens out in uh, Arizona, Arizona. In Prescott. They're teaching a lot of our stuff now. They're what we would call a certified instructor, somebody that, you know, Kevin's been to the school probably 17 to 19 times during his career in the military. So, uh, you know, he ran the schoolhouse. He, you know, brought in a lot of our stuff into the schoolhouse. He knows it really well. So that would be another good one for somebody in the Arizona area or that would like to travel to that part of the world, uh, maybe when it's freezing out here. So, uh, but... There's that, and then there we have the long range made easy videos uh, that they can get from us as well that gives them a good you know, background. I even tell a lot of the students, you know, they're really cheap. Go in and purchase those, watch them before you go to the civilian classes because you're gonna be 10 times further along and you're gonna understand a lot of what the instructor is talking about. Uh, but yeah, there's you know, several good places guys can go to get good information you know, on the Trimmer 3 and the Kestrel. Awesome. Um, we've had a lot of people ask about, uh, so 22 long range is coming in. Everybody thinks it's, everybody's enjoying it. And with not being able to get out to long ranges right now, it's a good thing to play around with. So people want to know how you true your 22. Go ahead. All right. So truing the 22, basically truing anything. So whether you're truing a, uh, uh, subsonic 22 or, mm -hmm. you know, again, when you're talking subsonic ammo, uh, we're not looking at Mach 1.2 if it's subsonic ammo. So uh, it, it's, you know, how far are you shooting? If you're shooting out to 300, I would probably want to try to true my weapon system around 150 to 200, you know, yards, uh, something like that. If, if it continued and worked, so, you know, if you just gave me a gun and it was a 22 and said, hey, I know nothing about it. I know nothing about the ammo. And I said, okay, how far are we going to shoot this thing? You said, uh, let's try to shoot it out to 200 today. I'd say, all right, hey, uh, let's get a hundred meter zero on it. And we may decide, hey, you know, let's get a 50 meter zero on it. Let's true it out at 150. Now let's come back and confirm that we're still good at 100, 125. Now let's go to 200 and check. And if we saw a drop off once we got to 200, uh, then we would actually cor correct it with the DSF. So we've been that secondary algorithm back to, to the, where the bullet was actually hitting again so you would you would true you would go under mv and do true yes. mv okay yes if it, if it was a supersonic round for sure yeah and, and we've done this with 308s yeah. with subsonic rounds yeah uh we've done the okay. same thing subsonic 308s and we're truing muzzle awesome. So it's, you know, once you're playing with DSF, DSF is just the secondary portion. You know, you, when you think about what truing is, we're just connecting the dots. That, that's all it is. So a lot of times when, when we talk about truing Muzzawasi as opposed to truing uh, uh, your BC or kind of the secondary portion, the DSF side, uh, we, what we're looking for initially, most of the time your BCs are going to be somewhat of a known, especially if you're using uh, the custom drag models from, from Brian. So once you have that known, and we know because we have a Kessler, right? We know the atmospheric, so we know our density altitude. The big three are Muzzawasi, BC, and DA. 
All right, so if you have a custom drag model and we have a Kestrel giving us good DA, the unknown is the muzzle And somebody says, well, you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a chronograph. Well, there's a lot of variabilities in chronographs. And, and so I tell people, you know, I agree 100% when you say a custom drag model and a uh, chrono number, is that going to work? And I tell people, probably, absolutely, that'll work. You know, me and Brian Litz agree that's the absolute best way to go. Take a, a chronograph, take a custom drag model, stick it in your Kestrel and shoot it, and you should be on. And then Brian always says, and if it isn't on, what do you do? You true. All right, because truing is fixing any errors potentially in your system that you're not aware of. Obviously, it's not going to be DA. There may be some things that the individual has done in his Kestrel that has skewed some things. Maybe he has inclination plugged in. Uh, maybe he has some some other errors that, you know, he's uh, he has the wrong bore height plugged in. Different little bitty things, right? But when we're talking about it, really what we're trying to do is find the time of flight, which is based off muscle velocity, uh, and then working off of the drag component of BC and then the drag component of DA. And so what we're doing is trying to find that algorithm that the bullet's flying. In. Well, I always tell people, you know, if you listen to the bullet, watch the bullet, the bullet tells the truth, can't tell a lie. So I'm not gonna argue with the bullet on what it did. If it hit at seven mils, I'm gonna make the Kessel read seven mils, all right? And so I'm gonna go in there and adjust it. So there's variabilities in lots of BCs and this is something that's been one of the arguing points. And so a, a good argument, and you'll hear this from, it, from time to time, people say, well, why aren't we just truing the BC? If I have a chronograph and I know my chronograph number, mm -hmm. why don't I true the BC? And here's the reason we don't do that. So, and you could, and we have done it in the past. But, so let's talk about the problems of truing BC. Once you start adjusting the BC, what are you doing? Well, you're immediately changing a custom drag model, which is perfect math made for that bullet, all right? So now that we have perfect math, no, we're gonna get rid of that and we're gonna turn it into a G1 or G7. And the next time we do this, we'll bring our, you know, standard drag models that are this big and that big around. And, you know, whether it's a G1 and shaped like a 45 ACP, or it's a uh, boat tail hollow point type design that looks more something like what we shoot today in the G7. Uh, if you take a G1 or G7, it's not going to give you the same math that the custom drag model did. All right. Mm -hmm. So immediately, once you go past trans, you're not going to work out. All right. So if you're in the G1 and you're shooting out to 1200 meters with the 308, you're going to be about a meal up. All right. And it's just based on the math. The G1 is not going to be able pr to predict in or past transonic what your bullet's doing. So I tell people, normally you're gonna hit about a mil up if you're using a G1. Now, here's the other deal. If you're shooting in supersonic and you're using a G1, G7 or custom drag model and you true all three of them, so you shoot one bullet and you have three people each with a different Kestrel. One guy says he likes using a G1. Next guy says, no, I wanna use a G7, it's better. And the other guy goes, no, I'm gonna use a custom drag model they all see the bullet hit at seven mils, so they all true to seven mils. If you go all the way back and look at 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, all the way through, there won't be more than 0 0.07 mils prediction on any one of those at any range. So a G1 is just as good as a G7, and it's just as good as a custom drag model in the supersonic. But once you start going past that, then you're getting into huge uh, eras built in your uh, program. So what we try to tell the people, you know, is we, we had to uh, talk to a person today that was uh, looking on the internet and he found somebody saying, you know, that 600 meters was where he trues. And what did he say? So, he, yeah, he said 600 is where you want to come in and true it. And then uh, you want to do a DSF at multiple point two, I think. And that's, that's completely. Yeah. So. You don't it, want to do that. So you true your you true your muzzle velocity at Mach 1.2. We say inside of that by 10%. So you want to find the range where it's about 10% um, inside of that or anywhere inside at Mach 1.2 or within 10% of that. And then that's where you true your muzzle velocity. For DSF, you go out to Mach 0.9, right? So and beyond, you can go any distance past Mach 0.9 and do a DSF there. Uh, and that's that's just fine. Uh, you can do multiple DSFs as well to continue to bend that secondary algorithm back down to where to match the actual plot type of the bullet. But, um, and another thing, real quick on the, the, the actual truing, uh, there's a lot of uh, non-deterministic <laughs> variables that, that we're trying to account for. 
uh, with fruit. So sometimes the, uh, the barrel can actually degrade the BC of the bullet, right? And that's something you would never be able to know unless you shot through a very expensive Doppler radar or a very expensive, uh, or an ALR 88, which are phenomenal. Which um, we've done. Yeah, we've change. done it. We've seen them over and over again where the barrel has actually degraded the BC of the bullet. Now, the only way to know that is to come in and come in and true and it fixes all of that. So it'll come in, account for it, and then you're done and you move on. So that's what we're trying to do when we true is account for it. Tell the Kestrel, hey, this is where the bullet hit. This is what I want to see. And then from there, I want to come in and account for all these non-deterministic variables that I say non-deterministic. They are deterministic if you have really expensive equipment. But if you're just a normal shooter, to you, they're non-deterministic, right? Maybe you've got some errors also that you plugged in um, as far as input. But that's what we're trying to do with truing is, you know, give the guy the capability of being out on a range without a chronograph and be able to get just as good as information as he could do if he did have a chrono. So my deal is even when we're out shooting at two miles, we take the seven mil 300 normal, we go out and we zero it. We true it at 1,887 meters and we're shooting 3,200 meters on, you know, within three shots. And so we never use the chronograph. Yeah, and we never use a chronograph. So it, it's, it's, I say we never use it. We use it for uh, testing our extreme spread and standard deviation and when we're doing hand loads and we do use a chronograph for that, but we're not actually going back in and shooting, you know, after we get through building X amount of ammo, we don't go out and shoot through the chronograph and then plug it in. We go, oh, it's gotta be close to 3,300. We plug in 3,300, we shoot and we go, oh wow, that's 3,340. Boom, we know our number now. Now let's go to two miles, all right? So now we're shooting 3,200 meters and the first round was just off the left edge of the target. So this is something that it's, you know, even Brian Litz said, it's when you have a chronograph and you have a custom drag model, that is the best thing you can do. But if you true a custom drag model, that's equal. So that the key here is why, why do people have problems? I mean, the, the reason they have problems is they're doing it wrong. They're not following the rules. They need to be within that 10 to 15% of trans. Otherwise, what happens is when he trues at 600 meters, he's not getting uh, a good resolution of what his muzzle velocity really is. And so he goes, oh, you know, I'm running 2850. Well, he's not running 2850. He's running 2800, but his cone of fire between 2850 and, and 2800 is within the same cone of fire, the impact point. So there isn't enough deviation at 600. You know, a, a, a 6.5 should be trued around 1,200 meters, you know, at 2,800 feet per second. So if he's truing at 600 meters, and we tell people a tenth of a mil is about 10 feet per second at truing distance. So now we're back in at 600. He could be as much as 100 feet per second off and not even know it. But now it's going to really show up as a big era once he shoots out it for the range itself. So. That, that resolution issue is, is extremely important. We, we see it quite a bit, and that's something to really kind of hit home on, is that's why you cannot crew up close. Um, you may be hitting perfect where you thought you were, but if you don't fire enough rounds, you're not going to be able to see center of the group, and you can't determine it accurately enough to be able to go, hey, here up close, I've got this much issue, but out at further distance, now that issue is going to really compound and you're going to see much greater error. Um, and so one of the questions, I think what it was, I, I kind of combined the two, um, but the, the guy who trued at 600 then went and trued his uh, BC, I believe, at 900. Um, and so really what happened was he trued his muzzle velocity at 600, had an error in that, that he couldn't perceive, and that changed the muzzle velocity by a lot, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was probably quite a bit long. It may have been a little bit off, but either way, that error was then compounded at distance. And so he made up for that erroneous true at 600, at 900, by then changing his BC. Whereas if he would have just done it at the proper distance, he wouldn't have seen any error. Model, he would have never seen anything different. You know, it's, it's one of those deals, you know, it's since, you know, about 2003 when I came up with truing. Uh, the Muswasi and, and the BC at that time, which we now, you know, do a DSF, which is just the secondary portion of the flight path. Uh, since then, we've trained probably 14 guys a week, every week for 17 years. So we're looking at, you know, 8,000 plus guys. Not one time out of 8,000 guys have I ever seen truing not work. So it's not like, well, it works for some people. And we hear stuff like, oh, it, it works at their place, but it doesn't work anywhere else. <laughs> and so, you know, and that's absolutely crazy but you know i wish i was that smart to make something only work here and not work anywhere else
But but the reality is, if you do it right, it doesn't have an option. All I'm doing is listening to the bullet and making the algorithm match what the bullet does. And so a lot of times guys can bend it by actually placing different points. And, you know, even if he does something wrong with a muzzle velocity at 600 and he has to do DSF at 900, he's not even at, you know, 1200 where he should have treated in the first place. He can correct it and bend it because you're just placing data points is all you're doing. So you can go, yeah, but it's working. And yep, it's, it's going to continue to work, but you're making corrections you should have never had to make. You know, and, so you're and we hear wasting people, ammo, right? You're wasting rounds yeah, by doing that. But, and people go, yeah, but it doesn't, you know, it didn't work. I was way off at 900. You, you was off because you did it wrong. Uh, and then you corrected it by doing a DSF and that got you back on track. And again, you're going to have to do another DSF later on because you're going to be off again because you have uh, an air in your muzzle velocity and an air in your BC that's going to compound as you go farther out. And you're going to have to continue correcting those as you go. But the key thing here is uh, the custom drag model is much better than the G1, G7 once we get far out. And that's why we don't true the BC. So the initial question on this, sorry, it's taking so long. <laughs> You know, truing up a uh, subsonic or even supersonic 22, I'm probably going to look at the distance. I know Pete, when he comes up and does stuff, you know, uh, with us with the military, he loves his 22 shooting and he goes out and shoots prairie dogs and he's chasing 400 meters on a prairie dog. So, you know, and he's using prisms and everything. But again, he would probably go out and true it at 200 and then start a DSF maybe at 300 and then rebend it again at 350. Uh, but it wouldn't be hard. You're just connecting data points is all it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Gaza would like to go back to that accuracy first menu and understand. So the question they wrote is, is the wind dot under the accuracy first menu, the value in miles per hour of my wind dot in the tremor three? Yes. That was an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> easy day. Next question. Sure. We, you know, we may give you 4.7. I can't call 0.3 mile an hour. That means I took five mile an hour. You know, if, right. if you land, here's here's a good key point for people, though. If you land at four and a half, uh, and I've seen guys go, well, it's really 4.4, but I'm just going to round to five because, you know, it, 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 they want to have a faster gun, all right? So they want the wind up to be five mile an hour. If I'm going to round, I'm going to round down because it can, it's going to make you have a stronger wind call in reality. So you're using more wind dots when you do that. So if you said uh, 16 mile an hour, well, if I've got a four mile an hour wind up, that's four dots, right? So, but right. if I have a five mile hour wind dot, that's three dots, just barely over. So I'm making a stronger wind call. And most of the time, probably at least 80% of the misses we see are on the weak side of the target. So just by making that little bit of correct or error correction and favoring a little bit more wind, which is the smaller number, then that would be uh, probably, you know, increase the hit probability for most people because it's gonna make them have a stronger wind call. Right. Uh, and one of the reasons we did come in and put the mile an hour value to the tent is we wanted to leave it open to the guys as well. If you want to be that accurate, by all means, go and be that accurate. But I, I can't call wind within a tent and I don't know anybody else who can. Um, so I'm definitely not gonna to try to do that. Um, a lot of the ways you can come in and try to fudge this as well, if you want to make it a little bit more accurate. So let's say you end up at four and a half mile an hour is your perfect wind up value. Um, you come in, you could round it down to four and then say, hey, you know what? Every four wind dots, I'm gonna make up to that in a correction by coming in and shifting left to right, depending or uh, depending on the direction. Of the wind. Yeah, and so I tell people all yeah. the time, if you know you're, you know, it says uh, 4.7 and you're calling at five, you're over calling by 0.3. So it's really easy if you're over calling mm -hmm. the wind, then you can just back off a little bit on your favor. So, you know, once you get set up with the third wind dot, you can, you can back off a little bit or increase a little bit, whichever way you need to fade, and just do it with a quick favor instead of plugging in and trying to do all the math. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're shooting that much wind anyway, uh, it's changing. So you need to get that shot off before it changes three times. So typical winds that you guys see on a typical training day at your ranges? You know, average is uh, 17 mile an hour. Today was 24, yesterday was 33. So, you know, anything, uh, and, and we love going out and shooting in high winds. It lets people really see AJ. So when it's blowing 48 miles an hour, uh, we make sure we go out and we shoot. And it, it really lets you see AJ, you know, even at 100 meters, you know, it's going to be every eight miles an hour. So you're looking at 0.6 mils, you know, you're hitting two inches up or down just based off of AJ. And AJ's on the accuracy first page, so it'll actually give you that number. 
uh, and that number is based on what is 0.1 mils. So if it says you're at eight mile an hour, every eight mile an hour is gonna have a 0.1 elevation component based on the crosswind. So that's what that number is looking for. So, it, and I tell people most of the time it's gonna be eight, unless, you know, Kobe shoots a real fast seven twist, uh, 308, and I believe you're a five mile an hour on your AJ. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really five mile an hour, but I actually go ahead and just round it to four. Um, so here's real quick on this before I get into that. Um, AJ is only determined by winds at your location, so you don't want to use ballistic winds. Um, you want to use positional winds for determining AJ uh, for mm -hmm. aerodynamic jump. Um, but what I like to do if I'm trying to shoot fast, uh, if I've got a cow that pops up and I need to um, you know, be quick on a wind call or something like that, uh, I like to round it down to four mile an hour because then every wind dot that I hold is just point one worth of AJ. Now there will be error in that because I'm using ballistic winds, not positional winds to account for my AJ, but it's, it's really not that big of an error and I'm willing to accept it if I'm trying to get a shot off that's uh, fast and relatively accurate. Um, and so if I'm willing up, and most of the time you don't see a whole lot of difference between positional and ballistic winds in the realm of AJ, uh, you can very easily and we see it out here, but um, and a lot of times you're not going to see something more than 0.2 or something like Do that. You want to ex can you explain the difference between positional and ballistic? So positional winds are winds at your location and ballistic winds are the winds that uh, end up giving you that final hold. So if I have to hold 16 mile an hour to get the target, then that's a ballistic wind. Uh, positional winds, I may only feel four mile an hour here, yep. but, if, uh, but it may take 16 mile an hour to hit the target. And that's because maybe I have um, you know, something blocking the wind at my location. I maybe have it, you know, shooting into some kind of orograph or catabatic flow um, or something where the terrain is channeling or changing that wind where at my location, I see something completely different than what it takes to hit the target. And that's, that's really why we uh, use this and, and why we use different tools and methods of managing the Kestrel in such a way is because positional winds will lie to you the time yeah. they are very critical to so the way i see it is position winds are a star right a wind call is a guessing game, right you're trying to guess what the final hold is going to be mm -hmm. um and when you start with a guess right that that never really works out so i'm going to start with a known and the only known i will ever have in a wind call is when in my location it may be wrong right if i try to hold position winds i'm i'm very most of the time you're probably going to miss a target if you try yeah. to hold position winds um what are whatever that hold is for that position wind. So what you want to do is use the position wind as a start to your wind call, not an end point. It's a starting point. So you come in and you grow off of that positional call. And you go, hey, this is what my final wind call is going to be. If I started here and I grew off that. If you start here and end up here, that's fine. At least you did the process and you ended up back in the same spot. And you said, hey, I think ballistic winds match position winds. That's cool. But don't just take wind at your location is the end all be all to a final wind call. Right, I think that's a ball. big problem that Kestrel users often fall into because they have a wind meter in their hand they do. and we try and teach them that it's it's a way to learn wind. It's a way to learn what the wind is doing to the vegetation around you so you can apply it downrange and more yes. so than using it exactly where you're standing. Exactly. And, and another point I want to be very clear on as well, the, the, the applied ballistic score is phenomenal here and it will account for AJ for you. It will account for AJ um, in uh, win one. So whatever win, one. win you got plugged into win one, it'll account for that. All right. It doesn't, AJ is not being applied to win two. And for that reason, the reason we don't do that uh, for both of them is because we've only got one elevation hold. It'd be really confusing if we gave you two elevation holds for one target. Um, so we just picked, we want one elevation hold. We pick one win to give you and that's win one. So AJ is being applied to win one and uh, win one only. Um, so if I've got win one set to zero, I'm not doing um, AJ in the final hole. Um, and so that's, I think that was another question that um, somebody had asked about why we set wind to three o'clock, wind speed one at zero, wind speed two at four, or wind speed one at four and wind speed two at four. Um, and that's, that's a phenomenal question. And the reason is, is because a lot of the times um, we're, we're shooting on the fly, we're, we're coming out, we're moving, we're changing targets. Wind is changing all the time. I'm getting a different cosine value. I'm getting a different wind velocity value. I'm getting a lot of different information very quickly. And I need to be able to come in and take a shot quick 
uh, before that wind changes. And so sometimes it takes too long to come in and input everything into that Kestrel. And so what we want to do is come in and build a tool, a way of managing the Kestrel that I can get information fast and simply and then apply that to a final hole. And so what when uh, three o'clock, four mile an hour does is three o'clock is your full, full value in cosine, right? So mm -hmm. a four mile an hour hold, whatever mill value I get for that four mile an hour hold, it, and since wind is linear, I can just come in and say, if wind is double that speed, then it's double the mill hold for that four mile an hour. So if I look at 1200 meters and it says at four mile an hour, I need to hold one and a half mils. Well, then at eight mile an hour, I need to hold three mils, right? Let's say the wind shifts from three o'clock, all of a sudden now it's at one o'clock. Well, one o'clock is half value on my cosine. So what I'm doing is just taking what that wind call was and cutting it in half, right, from what I see. And so I'm able to come in and rapidly do um, adjustments when the environment around me is changing all the time and very quickly as well. Um, so as far as cosines go, uh, wind from 1230 is 25%, wind from one o'clock is 50%, 130 75%. Uh, two o'clock's ninety, and then anything after that, we call and that's slightly rounded. and that's that's rounded. Yeah, that's that's important. That is rounded. So in, in reality, uh, twelve thirty is uh, 0. 0.25, 0. 0.25 um, and then uh, one o'clock is 0. 0.5, and then uh, one thirty is 0. 0.707, and then two o'clock's 0.866, and then you got 0. 0.966. Uh, and twelve thirty, I said 0. 0.25. It is 0. 0.25, but it's 0. 0.25. Um, but so we round those up because we want to make the math simple. Right? We want to make the math easy. We deal with math and quarters every day, all day long. And so I call it 25%, 50%, 75%, 90%, and then full. Uh, and if wind is under 15 mile an hour, a lot of times two o'clock, I don't even call it 90%. I'll just call it full value. Increase my wind call by 10%. It's a difference of nine mile an hour versus 10 mile an hour. All right. Um, and then I come in, make the math simple, I round up because that gives me stronger wind call, increases the probability, and then I'm able to move on. Um, Dealing with the math in quarters is really simple. I, if I want to find 50%, all I have to do is cut a number in half. If I want to find 25%, I cut the number in half, then I cut it in half again. Right? That's 25%. If I want to find 75%, I'll cut it in half, cut it in half again, then add those two up, that's 75%. Right? It's very simple to do, and, and we can just move forward. Uh, if you want to do 90%, that's really easy as well. You just take your numbers, let's say it's 20 mile an hour, uh, and I go, how do I get to 90%? Well, I can say 100% minus 10%. That's 90%. So what's 10% of 20? That's two. You just move the decimal point over one. All right, so 20 minus two, that's 18. So 18 is 90% of 20. And that gets real simple when you start talking 32 mile an hour. So what's 90% of 32 mile an hour? Well, what's 10% of 32? Three, because I'm not doing the math of 3.2 because I can't call in within 0.2 mile an hour. So I say 32 minus three, and that's 29, and I'm off and running. All right, it's next so, so refreshing that Colby can really dumb down this math, unlike Todd. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, so here's the next question. So Travis asked, I'm just going to read his question directly. Is there a way to note the point at where the bullet is below the threshold recommended by manufacturer for the bullet to deform as designed within the range card? Did you get all that? Yeah. So I think what he's talking about is terminal ballistics, correct? Is that what you got from it? Yeah, I think so. He followed up. He said, much like the notation of when it goes to transonic and subsonic, and this would have to utilize data embedded in the CDM. Well, if from, from what I can remember what he asked, uh, if he's talking about terminal ballistics, each bullet has a different design. Some are not meant to expand. Uh, some are meant to expand, but don't do a very good job at it. All right. So, it's one of those things, uh, back in the day, we used to talk about kinetic energy and, and kinetic energy. I have a real good friend that worked for the, uh, I won't give his name out because I didn't ask permission for it today. So, but he worked for the FBI for 23 years and he was the- Oh, I love him. Issue. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell him you said hi. So <laughs> the, the deal is, you know, I, I was giving a speech one time uh, in, at a sniper event and I said, you know, I don't believe in kinetic energy for bullet expansion. I said, uh, what do you think? And he stood up and said, absolutely. Uh, he said, it, it's retained velocity that makes a bullet expand, not kinetic energy. However, we've had gun riders for the past hundred years tell us, you know, we need X amount of kinetic energy to make a bullet expand, uh, you know, at 700 meters. And it gives you, you know, whatever uh, kinetic energy that you perceive you need, whether it's a thousand foot pounds or 500 foot pounds for a small deer. 
And there's people out there that'll go, no, you know, I'm under a thousand foot pounds. I won't shoot an elk with this gun past that distance because my bullet's not going to perform because I don't have enough kinetic, kinetic energy. And he has shot more gelatin than anybody on the face of the planet. And he agrees with me hundred percent. Kinetic energy means nothing in bullet expansion. It's remained velo or retained velocity. So the remaining velocity is what makes a bullet expand. That doesn't mean that every bullet that has the same exact remaining velocity is going to expand the same. It's the expansion properties built into the bullet. Uh, and some have it, some don't. Some are not made to expand. They're not hunting bullets or target bullets, and they may have a higher BC because of that. Uh, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Barnes bullets. Uh, Barnes bullets are great for shooting when you're talking about hunting. However, Barnes bullets don't have a very high BC. But most of the time, you're looking at, you know, five, 600 meters in the end, they're going to perform great. Uh, doing shooting like me and Colby do, doing extended long range hunting. Uh, we're going to shoot a very high BC that can expand, which is something like a burger hybrid. So again, uh, it, it's one of those things that a lot of times we still have kinetic energy in the Kestrel because people want to see it. Does it mean anything? No, it doesn't. All right. So <laughs> later on this year, I'm looking at going on a buffalo hunt. All right. So and we're talking in South, South Africa. Kinetic energy is going to mean something on this one because I'm wanting that solid to continue going all the way through. So I'm not looking for expansion. I'm looking for kinetic energy pushing that bullet through. So in that type of hunting, yes, but uh, I'm not pulling out a Kestrel in my Cape Buffalo hunt. So it, it's a totally different type of hunting. But but most people or you know are confused by this. They think kinetic energy actually means something. Uh, as far as bullet expansion, it really doesn't. So you just mentioned hunting, and I know that's not what you guys train every week, but what, for both of you, what is your favorite hunt? Like if you had your ideal hunt that you've either already done or that you want to go do, what is it? I'm up with an elk. Yeah, okay, okay. bow hunting. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're, huge, yeah, we're huge fans of uh, bow hunting. Uh, it makes you really get, you know, in close to the animal and, and you're, you're part of his world and uh, the stealthiness and the amount of time you spend in the field. Uh, you know, I, I can remember what got me into bow hunting was the fact that, you know, it got so easy to shoot long range. And, you know, that's with, with the advent of, you know, kestrels in the reticles uh, and the good ammunition that we have now shooting, you know, 800,000, 1200 meters. It's not that hard, you know? So right. if you make a good wind call and now we have tools like the trimmer three that helps you with that wind call, uh, shooting long range isn't that big of a deal. It's not that hard. And I love to hunt. I love to spend time in the woods. Uh, so one of the biggest problems that I had was I would go out where we ranched and I, I knew where the deer were. You know, I'd see them all year on horseback. And I'd go out there opening day, daybreak, boom, animal's done. So, done. you know, my hunt was over. I, I'd not get <laughs> to hunt for another year and I got five minutes. So it pushed me into bow hunting. Now, uh, with the extended long range hunting that we do, nearly every evening in the hunting we're up on top of the hill it may be at 2,000 meters it may be at 1,500 meters it may be a little bit farther we're not going to get into <laughs> talking about other long-range shooting but uh, we're, we're lucky that we have uh, a friend that we do a lot of call permits for him right and we're uh, taking out animals that don't have the proper DNA that we would want to see them breed so he, he gets so many animals a year or so many permits like hey you need to take out 15 bucks. Well, we go through in the pickup and we say, hey, that one's on the list, that one's on the list. And so we know the deer we're shooting at at these extended dis distances. And if we didn't shoot them at those distances, uh, we'd shoot them at 25 meters, you know, outside the truck because we want them done. We want them off the property, you know? So yeah. it's, a, it's a game management in, in the state of Texas actually if you will fly and do the deer counts and do the management and actually take the animals off through property that, you know, that they tell you you need to take uh, in numbers, they, they give you the extra permits. And the game management, you know, when we first started uh, hunting on this ranch, a 160 class whitetail was a really nice big whitetail. Uh, now this year we've had deer that went, uh, we, I think 240 <laughs> was a typical. And so, I wow. mean, it's, we, we have some really massive big deer out here because of the game management, you know, so, but the question was, what do we like to hunt? Tar in New Zealand would be a big one. Uh, elk is always, one, you know, it's one of my most favorite hunts that you could do. 
Uh, elk hunting is phenomenal. I love it to hear on the bugle. Uh, it, again, you can get in some long range shooting or you can get into it with a bow. Nice. Colby, do you have a different opinion? No. <laughs> <laughs> bow hunting uh, is, is my absolute favorite. I, I'm, I've gotten into kind of long range bow hunting and stuff like that as well. Uh, but I, I don't think there's really any substitute for, you know, being up close. And I, I really personally, I don't like the uh, blind type hunting where you're in a blind and stuff like that. We used to live in East Texas, we're really wooded and stuff like that. And a lot of the times I hear, you know, guys say, you know, you can't spot and stalk in the woods. And, and really you can. Uh, you just have to pick your route really well. Typically you have to do it in the mornings when the dew's still on the ground so you're not as loud stomping through. Um, or you have to have kind of an idea where you're going to be and you may not be able to just book it and move kind of thing. But it's it, you, there's still an element to the spot and stalk that I, I absolutely love. Um, and that's, that's my favorite form of hunting is spot and sock. And then, um, with the bow and elk really, uh, tar is on, up, up there as well, though. That's probably my favorite. I, I went on a tar hunt, um, and, and got to shoot a tar. Um, and that was phenomenal. Um, just the senior year is worth it. I mean, it's, it's life changing just to be there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. absolutely. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, I really, really appreciate you guys. See how fast that went? And it wasn't yeah, two it was hours. Great. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you guys taking time. Hopefully we can do it again. Hopefully we're all back to work. You guys are um, getting a lot done because you don't have people down there. So we appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Good to see you again. Enjoyed it. I know. It's great to see you guys. So thanks so much. And hey, keep a list of questions coming in, uh, guys, and give them to Katie. And uh, once we get set up with another list of questions, uh, we'll do it again. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Enjoy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.